So, um, just to start off with, if you have any questions during the seminar, feel free to SMS our number. Our number is 0410729238. So you can ask any question you want there. We'll respond to it as well during the seminar. And if you want a PDF of today's content, please send us a text message for more details. We've got a few social media accounts. So we've got Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, WeChat. Feel free to follow us on that as well. So let's get into the actual seminar. Today is for year five and six students and we're going to cover reading and writing. So more specifically, how to approach reading and writing for your selective test and also for the scholarship entrance exams. As I said, my name's Julia, just a bit about me. So I'm the principal of JP English currently. I came first at James Roos in English, ninth in the state in English as well. And my ATAR was 99.85 and I've taught for eight years. Sambo also did very well in English. So she got second at James Roos in English. She got a 99.90 ATAR and she is currently studying medicine at UNSW. All right, so a bit about us. We've started as a tutoring school only for year seven to 12 English. However, over the years, we've had many parents approach us asking us when we're going to start our selective trial tests just to help year five and six students. So now what we've provided is the most advanced English and writing course for year five and six. We're covering all the different text types that can be uh, tested in the selective test and also the scholarship exams. We've dissected exactly what approach to take when answering different sorts of questions, just so students have the best chance at scoring the best marks in these exams. We also do high school English still. We start from year six, term three, and we go all the way to year 12 for the HSC. For primary school, so year five and six, our tutors are only James Roos graduates. That's our minimum requirement. Of course, there are other requirements for our tutors. They have to be able to teach. They have to be friendly, personable, inspiring to students as well. For high school, we only pick students who have, uh, ex-students who have done very, very well in their HSC English Advanced. So they have to get a minimum of 95 for their HSC mark. So that's a high band six. Uh, we also have New South Wales State Rankers and also James Juice graduates on our team. We offer online and face-to-face -face sessions, and you can have a look at our results on our website. We consistently produce 99.958s every single year, and many of our students have scored top band six marks. They've ranked in their top 10 at their schools as well, and every year we have HSC marks that are at least um, 97, 98 as our top mark. Okay, so just a bit about our programs for year five and six. So first program is our selective trial test program. This is three hours long every single week and we start from term two and we go all the way up to year six um, exam day essentially. Our trial tests are written all by James Roos graduates and we only do English and writing because we want to specialize in things that we're good at and do them very, very well and do them at the topmost standards for our students. So the structure of our classes for this three hour trial test program is we start off with the English, the reading and writing trial test. This goes for 70 minutes long, followed by a writing exam explanation, which goes for 60 minutes. So during this writing exam explanation, we not only cover the writing exam and how to approach it and also give feedback for students on how to improve next time, but we provide something extra. We give dense theory notes. And these theory notes are going through exactly how to approach different text types. So for writing these days, they've made the writing section of the selective exam the most diverse, the most unpredictable section of it. And that's really to weed out the B grade students from the A grade students. The fact that it's unpredictable, a lot of people find that it's, they assume that it's down to luck, but it really isn't. There is really a formulaic way to approach different text types. 
And what we provide in these theory notes is a step-by-step -step method of exactly what you need to achieve top bands in every single criteria in the writing exam. We go through diary entry articles, uh, feature articles, narratives, um, you know, all the different types, persuasives, even procedures. We never know what the exam can throw at us, so we need every single student that comes through our doors to be as prepared as possible. Not only that, but we also provide model answers. The reason why we provide these model answers is so that students have something to work towards. They know exactly what the end goal is. And these sample answers that we provide are only those that are written by top James Hughes graduates because we give our students the very best. We don't skimp on the details. Every little thing we double check, triple check, and make sure that our students are getting the best that they deserve. So that's our writing exam explanation and that goes for 60 minutes. We also have our reading exam explanation which goes for 50 minutes. Once again, we not only go through every single question that students got wrong for the reading exams, but we also go one step further and we provide theory notes. And these theory notes cover, it covers an exact science on how to approach these comprehension questions. We go through specific comprehension techniques, skill building as well, so that students know what common pitfalls there are when they're approaching new exams. Because just like writing, students will start to realize once they're in that program that there is a pattern to success. They would understand that, you know, these tests, they're engineered by experienced exam writers. And these exam writers, they know what the common pitfalls are and they exploit that. So they understand so they can see the different levels in different students. So we decipher all of that and we make sure that students see these patterns so that they can get better week by week progressively. Okay, so up to our second program, this is our intensive writing program. And this is a very popular course that many students' parents have requested over the years. This is one and a half hours every single week and it's just focused on writing because as I said previously, the writing section of this selected test is really what differentiates those top students from the B range students, right? And once again, we cover all the different text types that can be tested. This writing exam is also suitable for not only the selected test um, candidates, but also scholarship exams. So the structure for this is we start off with school homework and that plan preparation and this is 10 minutes at the very start of each lesson followed by a writing quiz and explanation. So with the writing quiz you just get students to write as much as they can under exam conditions and week by week slowly their exam technique improves as well. And this goes for 20 minutes followed by a theory component and writing exercises which is 30 minutes. And then, once again, we provide sample responses to these writing exercises because how can students improve if we're just giving them vague feedback? What we do at JP from the very first day that we started teaching is we not only give them detailed feedback tailored to their specific writing piece, but we also give a model response so they know what a good answer is and what they should be targeting towards. And we end each lesson with a 10 minute, uh, basically basic skills section. And this is just building upon their vocabulary and also refining their grammar. So just a bit about our high school courses as well. So we do year six from term three all the way to year 12. So year six term three to year 11, what we do is we follow the New South Wales syllabus and we cover the following. So we cover essay writing. So with essay writing, at schools in the high school curriculum, what they'll do is they'll do novel studies, poetry, Shakespearean plays, films, speeches, non-fiction, so on and so forth. So we cover all of these in our course. We also do comprehension exam practice. We do creative writing, discursive writing, persuasive and reflection writing because these are all the different types of writing that can be potentially tested in the high school curriculum. We also do comparative studies. We start each uh, lesson with a 15-minute quiz and we also have an end-of-term exam. 
We provide sample lenses for every single syllabus-based booklet we have every week, and also we provide very detailed notes on past students' exemplars. So these students' um, exemplars which we provide, these are all from top-ranking students who have achieved high band sixes and potentially state ranks in their HSC English Advanced uh, exam. We also provide school assessment help because we understand that school assessment marks is really what shows parents how their child is going in English. And we provide copious resources for the student school assessments. For our Year 12 course, so we, our lessons are purely focused on improving your school rank and your HSC mark. So we provide detailed resources for your specific school text. So whatever you studied in class, we provide resources for and additional notes for. We provide personalized feedback to your essays and creatives, sample essays and creatives on top student to state rankers, comprehension exam papers with sample answers, and detailed resources for all the different writing types. So that covers a bit about us. And now we're going to go into the structure of our seminar. So first part would be going through exam strategy, a writing theory, and also some exemplar responses. And our second part is going through the 2022 selective reading and writing sections. So I'll hand it over to Sambo. Hi, thank you, Julia. And hi, thank you for joining everyone and choosing to spend your Sunday night with us. So today I'm going to um, start off our session by just pointing out some common pitfalls that maybe you and even I sometimes can really relate to. So have you ever read through a passage and you think you've understood it and you may have even enjoyed it? But upon doing the questions, you realize that you didn't actually pick up on any of the information that would be relevant to the questions. And therefore, unfortunately, you need to spend time rereading large chunks of the passage. And um, if worse comes to worse, sometimes reading the entire passage multiple times. Well, here at JP English, we've actually crafted our strategy for success in reading comprehension. So let's get started with the first step. So it is so, so important to first, before you even read the passage, to really quickly skim the questions first and to extract one keyword from each question. And the reason behind this is that when you do start reading the passage, then you know exactly what to look out for. So you don't really waste time later on rereading huge chunks of the question. Then secondly, it's so important to actively read the passage rather than passively read it. And what exactly do we mean by actively reading or really engaging yourself and really just identifying where exactly are the relevant pieces of information? So how exactly do you actively read? Well, number one, please, please, please pay close attention to the topic sentence. It doesn't matter if the passage is an essay, if it's a persuasive, it's a creative or poem. Most likely, the first sentence, which we call the topic sentence, really does give that general overview of what exactly the main idea of that paragraph is about. Now, once you've finished reading that paragraph, well, it's so important to summarize each paragraph in just one or four words to really save yourself time. Um, and the way you could do this would be, oh, the first paragraph is about setting. The second paragraph is about character conflict. The third is about the character's motivations or challenges. Something really, really quick like this, this should usually only take like five seconds. And the reason why we do this is so that, again, we know exactly where to find the relevant information. For example, if the question asks, what is the setting like? And then you already know, you already know which parts of the passage or the paragraphs um, contain settings. So you immediately locate that in the passage rather than having to skim through the entire text again. Now, finally, the last step for active reading, really, really try to underline the key names, the key dates, the key places, etc. Especially because markers do like to um, test you on these keywords and test your speed in being able to identify where these keywords are. And finally, when you are attempting the questions, really try to read all four multiple choices. Um, oftentimes, the reason why selective can be so difficult is because at first glance, all options, so A, B, C, and D, 
all do seem to be quite correct. However, once you really take the time to read through all four questions, you are able to avoid some red herrings and also to just um, avoid making too quick of a judgment. Great, so um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, we'll move on to some common red herrings and multiple choice options. Um, so let's really put ourselves in the shoes of a test writer, right? They're trying to um, sort of weed out um, the best students, the cream of the crop. So how exactly do they do this? Well, in their multiple choices, they may choose the, to manipulate the modality. So say the passage may say, um, ads often like to drink milk. Note the key word, right? Often, note that slightly lower modality. However, in order to trick us, well, maybe in their options, they will say cats always like to drink milk. You see the distinction between often and always. Often means most of the times. Always means all of the time. So hopefully you see that distinction, which means that if you choose the option that cats always like to drink milk, then that is actually wrong. Cool. Um, next one would be some statements in the multiple choices are actually out of scope. So what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that the information given in the passage isn't sufficient in order to make the conclusion. So for example, if the passage says, Kim Henry loves to go hunting on the weekends, then the markers, oh sorry, the test writers might try to trick you by saying, well, Kim Henry um, goes hunting every single Saturday. Unfortunately, that may be true, that may be false. All in all, we don't have sufficient information to answer or to verify whether that option is true. And finally, some options are conditional. So please, please, please make sure to really underline some um, conditional words like except, unless, almost. Great, so now we've got that theory down, well, let's really try to test our strategy with some practice questions. So the first step in our strategy is before you even start reading the passage, please read the questions. So let's head on um, over to our questions. Um, yep, so, great. So here we have our questions. Let's read it together. What idea about storytelling is present in both texts? Great, we already know our keyword, storytelling. Um, so far we've seen a trend in the selective in that the first passage always is a comparison between two texts. So when we're reading, make notes to ourselves. We need to see what concepts about storytelling are present in both of them. Awesome. Now onto our second question. In text one, when was the second year of the Republic? Immediately red alarm should be ringed, right? Our keyword is Republic. So when we're reading, really try to see where the information about the Republic is. Now onto our last question. Which statement would the speaker in text two most resonate with? Well, this means this is an inference question. It's not directly going to tell us the answer within the passage. We really need to infer um, who the speaker is. What is the character? What are their motivations? What are their goals, their flaws, and their backstory? Great. So now that we've really understood um, the keywords of the questions and what we're trying to look out for in the passage, we're going to head on over to the first text and we'll spend roughly a few minutes to just read it in silence.
Okay, great. So I think maybe we can spend some time just processing that extract together. So let's start off with the first paragraph. I returned to Northeast Gaomi Township to compile a family chronicle, focusing on the famous battle on the banks of the Blackwater River that involved my father and ended with the death of a Jap general. Interesting. So let's really practice our active reading. Well, we made the point that actually the first sentence of, of a paragraph usually gives a general overview of what the passage is, of what that specific paragraph is about. So from the first topic sentence that I just read, well, we can already identify the key settings here. There's Northeast Gaomi Township, then there's also Blackwater River. Interesting. But also that topic sentence really is like gold because as you read it carefully, I returned to Northeast Gaumi Township to compile a family chronicle that immediately from the get-go already tells us the character's motivations. What is it? To compile a family chronicle, to really tell, try to tell a factual story about his family. Interesting. We can move on. Um, an old woman of 92 sang to me. A Blackwater River, the battle began, Jap souls never to rise again. The beautiful champion of women, Dai Feng Liang, broke the Jap attack with ranks. Again, red alarm should be ringing. There's a key um, name here, Dai Feng Liang. And once we read the um, rest of that paragraph, we realize that Dai Feng Liang is that, um, the speaker's grandma. And we realize with the song as well from the old woman of 92, really still carrying forward that motif or that recurrent theme of storytelling, which is a key word from the first question. Great. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Now let's move on to the second part, uh, second paragraph. Again, we're really um, keeping in mind the topic sentence. At the mention of my grandma, the woman's narration was choppy and confused. Interesting. So what does it really mean when someone's um, narration is choppy and confused? Maybe inconsistent, right? Maybe unreliable. And that's exactly what it means. It's saying that um, this old woman's storytelling, well, it's quite unreliable. So maybe it's quite inaccurate. Um, as we read further into the paragraph, well, it's just telling us more about the old woman's storytelling. Great. And then um, we'll move on to the third paragraph. So again, let's focus on the topic sentence. Ah Hat Liu played a significant role in my family's history, but there is no hard evidence that he had an affair with my grandma. And honestly, I don't believe it. Interesting. In this topic sentence, well, we're introduced to a more in-depth, to a character. Ah Hat Liu. So we can assume that um, this is what the remaining remainder of the paragraph is really about, and we are correct in that. Um, it's talking about the relationship between Grandma and Uncle Ah Hat. Interesting. Then we'll move to our final paragraph. In County Records, I discovered that in 1938, the 27th year of the Republic, 400,000 man days were spent by local workers from Gaomi to build the Jiaoping Highway. So very interesting. Why? Already red alarms are ringing because I can immediately spot the keyword Republic, which I know that I'll be using to answer the second question. Great. Um, let's move on to the second text. And I'll give you guys a bit longer to read that.
Cool, so just one more minute. Awesome, great. Um, so let's go through this. So um, just keeping in mind the question, um, it was to really infer what exactly is true about the speaker, what are their motivations, etc. Cool, so let's get a start. Standing in the shadow of my balcony, I look beyond the hotel grounds to where the brown mouth of the Busey River meets the Vera Harbour. Awesome, from that, I already know my summary, setting. That's all I need, just one word, setting. I was born near the mountain of two peaks, white men, Kulu and Kulimanjaro. Um, interesting, so giving more background into the character's history. Seraphim, so already red alarms, right? There's a new name here. So who is he? Let's find out. Seraphim sits in a chair in my room and listens to my words. He is a journalist from Brazil, sent here to Bear to record my story for National Geographic. I know very little about him, except that I'm comforted by the scratch, scratch of his pencil on paper. So hopefully um, from the topic sentence, we already know this paragraph is about Seraphin and also his duty, right? He's a journalist. And that um, that really reminds me that, oh, my the first question is about storytelling. So I can already see the key theme of storytelling. Moving on. Um, the next few parts about dialogue really do just show um, the speakers, how storytelling um, can reveal the speakers' um, connection to the, her, her family and also her culture's um, connection to the land as well. So you see how you can really just group sections of the passage into a li literal maybe one to four um, word summary, right? Connection to land and family. Cool. Then um, let's move on to the paragraph starting with in the past. So hopefully you guys can all see that. That's the third paragraph from the bottom. In the past, journalists like Seraphim had traveled great distances to meet me. Interesting. So um, I'm getting the idea that I'll be learning more about the character's backstory. They talked of the bigger world and how it was hungry to hear my work. They promised my story would help end the threat faced by people like me. Interesting. So from this paragraph, I'm getting still that theme of storytelling, how storytelling can really help raise awareness about maybe the experiences of others. Cool. Let's move on. There is nothing worse in this world than to be silenced, I say, and Seraphim's body relaxes, except perhaps being forgotten. So um, from this paragraph, Again, we see more of the character, the speaker's personality, right? She does not want silence or forgotten. Note the key word there, except that's a conditional word. So really, um, yeah, just in the mind of the marker, they may try to trip you up on that conditional word. But let's move on to the final paragraph. Our journalists have come before, or other journalists have come before looking, before him looking for facts. I have given them what they have asked, only to never hear of them again. I was feeling left, used, and empty. Interesting. So giving us more um, backstory, right? About how the character does feel used and empty. Like, the stories don't mean too much to those journalists, and maybe it's exploited. No more. I'm grateful I've hunted down words over the years so that I can begin to construct a story. A story that is my own. And do you guys see when we're reading that paragraph, there is a sudden shift in the tone. It goes from this feeling of maybe disappointment to this sense of empowerment, right? Regathering one's language and words to be, craft your own narrative. So that's very interesting. Again, linking to the key theme of storytelling and that was signposted to us by first reading the question. Great, so now that we have a better understanding of the passages by applying our active um, reading technique, let's head on back to the questions and let's um, go through it together. Awesome. So, what idea about storytelling is present in both texts? Remember, we must read all four multiple choices from A, B, C to D. A, storytelling is more often than not an accurate representation of human lives. 
interesting um, because in the first in the first passage, well, we actually heard about how the old woman's narrative was choppy and cut. So that does already give us an example that sometimes storytelling isn't an accurate rep representation of human lives. So we can eliminate that. Going to be the main purpose of storytelling is to raise awareness about social issues. Note the keyword main, right? Um, let's think about the first passage. What was the main purpose of storytelling there? It was more about to better understand um, one's family, right? And while the statement may be true for the second passage, well, it's not necessarily true for the first one. So let's keep on going. Let's go to um, option C. Storytelling should be based on factual evidence, um, not personal anecdotes. Well, we don't really um, get that get that impression from the first or second text. They're not really talking about facts versus fiction. More so, it's talking about um, how storytelling can really connect you to maybe your past, right? And then we go to option D. So storytelling is a vehicle through which people can connect with their kin. Yes. So um, you'll also note that sometimes it's selective. Um, the options may have more difficult vocab. For example, this one, this kin, this vehicle. Um, it's important to maybe just infer what exactly they mean. So kin means uh, maybe blood relatives or just people that you share a common feature with, right? Maybe your community. A vehicle just means a medium, right? So um, option D is correct because in the first one, well, the character's main motivation is to um, formulate a chronicle of his family's history. Therefore, you can infer that he wants to connect with their kin. In the second passage, well, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of dialogue about the speaker talking about um, her people's connection to the land. So really, um, D, by process of elimination um, and reading all four options, D is the most um, correct answer. Great. Um, so let's move on to question two. What is the second year of the Republic? Great. So if we can quickly go back to passage one. Great. So where did we see the keyword Republic? Well, quickly looking through, we see in the fourth paragraph, in County Records, I discovered that in 1938, the 27th year of the Republic, blah, blah, blah. So we immediately see the keyword Republic. It's important that when you see the keyword, you don't just stop there. You need to read the phrases or even sentences before that, and then the sentences or phrases after that. Because if you read the phrase before that, it says the 27th year of the Republic. But what does the question ask us? It asks us for the second year of the Republic. So therefore, it's important to take note of those keywords. And if we can go back to the um, question, you can just do simple math. So 1938 minus 25, and you get the answer B, 1913. Good. Now on to our final question. Which statement would the speaker in text stream most resonate with? Great, okay. This is quite a tricky one because it asks you to infer the passage, but also to infer the um, multiple choices. Let's go through um, multiple choice A. To be treated with indifference is the greatest tragedy our souls can suffer. Interesting, the, the key word here is indifference. Um, and indifference means that um, people uh, don't necessarily care about how you feel. So um, let's think back to passage two. So um, if we look at the par paragraph third from the bottom, well, it says, um, in the past, journalists like Sarah Kramer have traveled great distances to meet me. So by just reading that first topic sentence, you realize that, wait, journalists don't necessarily um, treat her with indifference. They actually spend quite a lot of time to reach her, um, to reach her land, to really hear about her stories. So um, option A isn't correct here. Now, let's go back to the question. Let's take a look at option B. My wings are clipped and my feet are tied. Interesting. So from that um, multiple choice, we can sort of see that tone of disempowerment. Interesting, because I do recall that there is that sense of disempowerment in the passage. Now, let's go to C. Still, like dust, 
arise. Interesting. So from that, I can hear that tone of resilience, of that sense of hope or perseverance. Very interesting. Um, and finally, D, I must let go of the past for empty hands are easier to hold. So this quote is about letting go of the past. But think carefully, did what are the character's motivations? Does she want to let go of the past? Not really, right? She spends a lot of time talking about her ancestry, about um, her desire to tell stories. So D isn't the correct answer. Now it's sort of a battle between B and C. And let's um, go back to the passage. Let's look at the final paragraph. So passage two, great. Other journalists like him have come before him to um, look for facts. I've given them what they have asked for, only to never hear from them again. I was, feeling left, I was left feeling used and empty, no more. Interesting, so there definitely is a tone of disempowerment. However, let's read the final few lines. No more. I'm grateful. I've hunted down words over the years so that I can begin to construct a story, a story that is my own. Interesting, right? We hear a more potent, a more powerful tone of resilience. And that's why we would choose um, C over B. Because think about it, put your shoes in the put yourself in the shoes of the test writer. Well, this extract is clearly from a much larger no, um, novel. And they chose an extract where the beginning clearly set the setting and then the end clearly set the tone of the character's motivations or their final motivations. And that's why the tone of empowerment here is more potent than the tone of disempowerment. And that's why um, for number three, we will choose option C. So hopefully that clears a few things up and really shows um, what exactly the test writers are thinking when they're trying to catch you out. Cool. So um, take a minute to digest all that and we'll move on to um, some writing. Great. So as Julia um, clearly mentioned at the beginning, um, over the years for selective and private school entry exams, we have seen a trend where the movings more they're moving away from the conventional creative writing, narrative writing, or persuasive writing, and really focusing on more diverse, more special text types. And sure, that may sound slightly daunting to us, but really we can see that as an opportunity to really learn more, to really um, show the marker what we've got, show the marker how creative we can really be. So one of the um, very common um, text types that the selective is really trying to test and nowadays is feature articles. So what exactly are feature articles? Well, they're a piece of non-fiction writing that focuses on a particular topic, so it could focus on a particular person, like maybe your favorite celebrity. It can focus on a social issue, like maybe climate change, very relevant to us. Or maybe it can focus on a personal experience, like going vegan for a week, something like that. And so what is our purpose as feature article writers? Well, our purpose is to, number one, inform, give a detailed description. But number two, to entertain readers, to really provoke thought, to maybe help the readers see another light, see another perspective on the issue at hand. Cool. So another element is that, yes, it is factual like a report, so news report, so it does have the facts, does have the statistics, does have the case studies. But the beauty of feature articles lies in that it goes beyond the facts to really weave in that really interesting narrative. So by that nature, well, it's the tone. The tone is highly emotive, right? It really expresses the emotions of um, the writer and it also evokes emotions from us, the readers. And ultimately it is quite subjective as well. And um, you can find examples of feature articles on The Guardian, The Sydney Morning Herald, but if you want to find um, feature articles written by top selective students, um, especially ones that fit within the word count that is feasible for selective, so 500 to 600 words, then our course, our reading and writing, sorry, our writing course and our selective course definitely does have many of those for you. Great, so um, let's move forward. And let's dive straight into an exam question. Um, I'll give you guys one minute to read that to yourself.
Okay, so our first step, like um, reading as well, read the question first, uh, identify the key words. You are a journalist who is fortunate enough to spend a day with your favourite artist, that's another key word. Write a feature article, that's another key word, about your interactions, that's another key word, with the artist and you nearly gain insights into their lifestyles, motivations, challenges and triumphs. So hopefully you can see that the keywords are highlighted in red. That is what you're going to try to do when you approach an exam question. So immediately we get some um, some key ideas from those keywords. Think about what an artist, what artist inspires you most. Maybe they're a musician, maybe they're a writer, maybe they're a playwright. What are their motivations, challenges, triumphs and lifestyles, and what life lessons have you learned from them? Also. Um, let's hop on to the next slide. Now, how exactly do we plan? Well, what exactly do we base our entire feature article on? Well, it's really a central anecdote, right? And really try to limit this to one central anecdote, just because in selective, in private school exams, you only have roughly 30 minutes. You don't have time to really expand on um, 10 central anecdotes, right? So really identify one central anecdote and setting. And below, we have some brilliant um, examples for you, like walking with a sculptor through an art gallery that immediately establishes an interesting setting, the art gallery, establishes an interesting artist, a sculptor, and already establishes the interaction, it's walking with the sculptor. Nice. Secondly, let's characterize the artist. How many times have you go, guys heard show not tell? But how exactly do we do that? Well, show the um, show not tell the artist's personality through actions, interactions with others, attitudes, dialogue, and appearance. And in our writing course, we'll go through more in depth on how exactly to show not tell and how to effectively characterize them. Now, the next step is really goal because often when um, students read that stimulus, then they think they oh their only job is to mention the artist. But no, note how you're talking from the voice of a journalist. So really do your best to also characterize the journalist. Ask yourself, why does this journalist look up to the artist? What are the journalist's motivations and backstory? And finally, because this is a feature article, um, we need to have the form of a feature article. So use real quotes and real examples. Great, so now we have the planning done. Um, let's hop on to a checklist for success. So yes, our language, strong, sustained voice. Um, Definitely use literary devices. Then we also need narrational conventions. What that means is there needs to be a clear, cohesive, progressive plot still. For what examples? And then answering the stimulus. Great, let's hop on to an exemplar. So I will give you guys maybe um, two minutes to just read through this slide.
Great. Um, this is just the first page, but we'll go through it together and then we'll move on to the ending of this piece. Now let's look at the title, Marina Abramovich, the artist who let her audience try to kill her. How interesting is that title? How catchy is it, right? By nature, your feature article really, really, really needs to have that really catchy, really eye-opening title. Great, let's move on. There are 72 objects on the table that one can use on me as desired. Performance, I am the object. During this period, I take full responsibility. Beautiful opening. Why? Well, it actually references Marina Abramovich, so that's the artist's work. Um, yeah, and it really does just allude to who exactly Marina Abramovich is. It has been five decades since the closing of her Rhythm Zero exhibition, yet Marina Abramovich's instructions to her audience remain as haunting as ever. Among the 72 objects on that table were a loaf of bread, a rose, scissors, nails, a bullet, and a gun. Dubbed the grandmother of performance art, Marina truly is a trailblazer. I stand amongst the expansive walls, uh, white walls of Studio Mora in Naples, as Marina reels in the memories of that one man who pointed a loaded gun to her head, the mother who sliced off her clothes, the teenagers who pierced her body with thorns. Look at those two paragraphs. That really clearly establishes who Marina Abramovich is. She's someone who puts on a performance that is quite haunting, quite confronting. She's someone who is very courageous. And um, unfortunately, you do also see um, a worse side of humanity, right? Um, our violent side. Interesting. Let's move on. Your own performances can go very far. But if you leave decisions to the public, you can be killed. She confides in me with a solemn nod. So that is a direct quote from Marina. And I understand that under exam conditions, you may not know the quotes um, word for word, right? So really, it's your job to be creative, to make something up on the spot that really does characterize or fit within the character of your favorite artist. Let's move on. Indeed, the work has left its mark on the artist. Or her art aims to shock a poor and disgust her audience, Marina bears the brunt of her cause. She shows me the knife scars that spread like raindrops on her knees and shoulders. So why does Marina put her life on the line for art? Beautiful rhetorical question, which is very provocative, right? Why does she, truly, why does she put her life on the line for art, right? So it's really important to have these really evocative, provocative rhetorical questions in um, your feature article. Why? Because it evokes thought but, um, within the readers as well. And therefore, it makes the reader or your marker much more engaged in your feature article. Hopefully, that um, starts to make a bit more sense. She makes her answer loud and clear. Art, should, to me, should push the body and mind to limits we don't understand. I expose myself to life and human nature, and from that, ideas come as a surprise. Her words weigh heavily on my heart. I had abandoned this sort of mentality when my dad was in avant-garde art, failed to pay my monthly bills. A part of me views her in jealousy. Now traveling amongst the inner circles of the elite like Lady Gaga, Marina seems to have it all. The success, the money, the fame, the influence. Interesting and beautiful paragraph. Why? Because not only does it provide background on the artist, it provides background on the journalist. It shows his regret. It shows his motivations or his backstory. He previously wanted to experiment with avant-garde art, but something, something made him decide not to do that. And great. So hopefully you see um, how important it is to characterize both the speaker and the subject of this feature article. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to read this paragraph, uh, this um, part to yourself in silence.
Great, so hopefully you guys have gotten a read of it. If not, not all good, we'll go for it together. But it is as if Marina has read my mind. For more than 50 years, nobody took this form of art seriously. She lowers her head and I imagine her thinking back to her childhood home in Yugoslavia. For more than 50 years, I struggled to even feed myself. Beautiful showing of um, Marina's backstory through her dialogue. Now, um, the next two paragraphs are quite interesting, and hopefully you can see some parallels between the next two paragraphs and the paragraph about Marina that we just read. Um, I think back to the conversation I had with my mother that day when I graduated with my fine arts degree from Sydney University. Be reasonable, my mother had said. Find a job you don't hate and support yourself. Since then, I've really trespassed into my fantasies of directing experimental theatre. But for just a moment, Marina's gaze makes me wonder if something more awaits me. Very interesting, right? Because we sort of see um, how both the speaker, both the journalist and the artist, at one point in their life they have been discouraged by others, but still, they ultimately still have that drive to pursue what they want, right? And you'll see with the um, sentence, but for just a moment, Marina's gaze makes me wonder if something more awaits me. It really shows the artist's impact on the journalist, which is what the um, question asks us to do, right? Identify what exactly are the interactions between the artist and the journalist. Moving on, towards dinner time, Marina invites me back to her hotel room for a farewell bourbon. Hopefully you see how this, um, this feature article, there is really a strong narrative flowing through it, right? Which is exactly what you want to do. And this is how you differentiate your feature article from a news report. She's packing for a month-long trip up to a Tibetan monastery in Mongolia. I'm interested in nature and people from different cultures whose bodies know no limit, she says as she puts a knife in her left back. She never stays in a place for too long. Interesting. Marina Abramovich is an artist through and through. When she's not using her body as a canvas, Marina holds courses for aspiring artists on how not to be exploited by galleries. Again, really showing that altruistic, that moral character of Marina that um, from the um, journalist tone of reverence, right? You can sort of see that the um, journalist does have that respectful tone towards Marina. Um, that is what really inspires the journalist. Moving on to our final paragraph. As I leave for the subway back home, again, that narrational co um, convention, right? This still is a plot running through this piece. Marina leaves me with one last piece of advice. Something like one last piece of advice that really, again, solidifies the progression of the feature article, right? It's telling us this is the end. This is the final piece of advice or words from Marina. Hold on to your dreams, and then what brings you into new territory? Woman giddy from the evening bourbon, a nod as Marina Abramovich's words follow me out into the deep winter night. So hopefully you do see sort of that character change in the journalist, right? Um, they become more empowered to pursue what exactly they really want. So hopefully from reading that example, you do see how um, this author um, really, this composer really effectively answers the question, right? The triumphs, the challenges, the lifestyles um, of that artist, but also does have a strong narrative voice of the journalist as well. So hopefully by going through that, you guys have learned a thing or two. Great, I'll now hand over to Julia. So what Sandra just went through, those are some sample questions that we have in our material for students. Um, as we said, we provide sample responses to a very high standard and all of our exams are written by very experienced exam writers who graduated from James Struis. Um, and also we try to make every single question as tricky as possible. Every single multiple choice question is done with a lot of thoughts behind it. So now we're going to go into the 2022 selective test. We're going to start off with a passage from it. So this is a poem. And as Sambara said, we always want to read the question first and think about what the key things are from these questions. So question number one, in the poem, the description of the surf is shift. Okay, so key word in that is shift. And also we need to look out for the, how the poet conveys the surface. Shifts means 
changing from one thing to another. So we need to figure out what are the changes in this poem. Second question, what is the main idea developed in the poem? So this requires a more overall, broad understanding of the poem, which is why it's so important to actively read the poem as well. As we go through each stanza, it's really important to just summarize mentally just a few words, even a sentence of what the stanza is about and see how this progresses throughout the poem just because of that first question about the shift. I'll give you guys just two minutes to read through this poem and then we'll go through it together. Alright, so hopefully that was enough time for you to have a read through this and hopefully when you read through it, you were actively reading. Now, I just wanted to go through some things to look out for when we're doing poetry as well. Because as I said, different text types require a different lens when you're reading um, these text types. With poetry, it's very much based on tone, on words being crafted together to create a piece of image. It's not like a feature article or a narrative where things are more concrete. With poetry, it's really open to interpretation. But the main thing is figuring out what the tone of each stanza is about. So first of all, visualize the setting and the images. Okay, um, Poetry is about words working together to create a mood as well. And figuring out how the persona of the poem is feeling. Also think about whose perspective this poem is from because that can change the attitude this persona has towards the subject matter. Okay, so back to the question. So this time round, we're not going to actively read the poem together because we've already gone through active reading with our first um, comparative question. But what we will do is focus a bit more on how to differentiate the options in each multiple choice question. Okay, so let's have a look at question number one. So we're going to look at every single option and I'm going to go through with you my thought process as I'm going through this. First of all, from a sense of collaboration to one of self-reliance. Okay, so if we have a look at these, these bits here and we have a look back at the question. So is it a sense of collaboration? Yes, it is because we see a lot of inclusive language. So that's another thing you guys need to think about when you're reading through any sort of text type in comprehension. You need to think about your language techniques. So I'm sure when you guys are writing your, um, writing your pieces for your writing exam, um, you should be also thinking about what techniques to include. So for comprehension, it's important to look out at the word choices that the exam writer has included. So in this case, inclusive language there, they, okay? So also here, latest they can, they slice, blah, blah, blah. So the entire poem is inclusive language, essentially. So there's definitely that sense of collaboration, but is there one of self-reliance? Not really, to be honest, because as we mentioned, the whole poem has inclusive language, and inclusive language means that these two surfers are collaborating constantly. If A was correct, 
then rather than um, if there was self-reliance at the end of the poem, rather than inclusive language, it'd be I, me, or he, she, singular pronouns rather than inclusive pronouns, okay? So it's the little things when you're doing these comprehension exams is um, weeding out what's false in every single option. Okay, B, from a feeling of apprehension to one of achievements, okay? So feeling of apprehension to one of achievement, that sounds a bit reasonable because that's kind of what the poem's about, but we need to, once again, be very discerning with every single word that this poet uses. Okay, so with apprehension, if we have a read through the first half of the poem, because this question's about a shift, so we can roughly divide the poem into two. So first half of the poem, is there anything about apprehension with the surfer? If we skip through this paragraph, it doesn't really talk about the surfer, so we're going to move on to the next uh, stanza. Here we start seeing a bit of the surfer. So we have, from their hiding rise to sight, black shapes on boards, right? Black shapes on boards, that almost makes the surfers seem more ominous. Keep in mind as well, think about uh, whose perspective this poem is from. Is it from the surfer's perspective or is it from a third person perspective, a third person persona who's observing these surfers? Well, in my opinion, it's the latter. It's the second one, right? So this is a third person account of these surfers. And the third person account views these surfers as black shapes. We also need to think about connotations. So connotations is spelled C-O-N-N-O-T-A-T-I-O-N for those who aren't sure what that means. Connotations means the associated meanings of certain words. For example, you're talking about someone as uh, very trusting. Trusting has very positive connotations, right? We associate the word trusting with good things. Whereas if you're saying the same thing about a person with a negative connotation, you'd say they're very naive. Naive is associated with bad things, right? Naivety is associated with gullibility. So you always need to think about connotations. Why would a writer choose one word over another? In this case, black suggests something on, ominous. And once again, this is from the persona's perspective and it's not the surface perspective. So it makes the persona um, view the surface with apprehension. But look at the question. The question's not talking about a feeling, uh, the surface feeling of apprehension, right? That's why B is incorrect. Okay, C, an impression of immobility to one of rapid movement. So, once again, having a look at this half of the poem, immobility, we're trying to find keywords um, related to that, but we're also trying to find words that contradict to that, because once it contradicts, that means that's not the right answer. So we have a look, immobility, we have connotations once again. Once again, we're looking at the tone, we're looking at the connotations of a certain stanza. Wall has connotations of something blocking something else. Down ribbed. Ribbed has connotations of being quite structured, of being quite conf confining even, right? Steep, inclined, so something that's quite formidable. Hiding rise. So this wall seems to hide them, right? So once again, that idea of not being able to move against this wall, right? So immobility is being supported by these two stanzas currently. Okay, so um, once again, keeps them so still, immobility. Do we see anything else that contradicts that? Not at the moment, to be honest. If we have a look at this bit here, to one of rapid movement, where do we see that? We see that here a lot now, right? Slice the face in time procession. So it's a lot of rapid movements there. Balance is triumph in this place. So there is a total shift now. You have a sense of being trapped by this wave, of being stifled in movement, to a sense of free movement now, right? They rode a fluid shelf. You can have a look at the active verbs here. Breaks, falls, loses itself. Slickers, seals, loosen and tingle, right? So you can see that C is quite supported 
by the poem. However, we still need to look at D because we're finding the best option. Not just the correct option, but the best option. So if we have a look at D, from a state of relaxed indifference to one of active participation. State of relaxed indifference. Do we really see that? Honestly, I don't, I don't think so. Indifference means they don't really care, right? But in this case, it seems like they do care because it says a learned skill here. They poise their weight, they pale their curl. So you can see that they're being very careful with their movements. So just from that, you already know D is incorrect. So that's why the answer is C. Okay, the next question. This question is a bit challenging because we've noticed that two answers are quite similar to each other, but ultimately we need to find the best option. So we have a look at option A. The effort involved in developing a physical skill. Okay, we do kind of see that throughout this poem, right? Um, just go back to the poem. So um, we can see from here, you know, there's a bit of effort. Honestly, there's not too much effort because if the if that option is, you know, the ideal option, then what you'd see is a lot of perseverance conveyed in these stances, but they don't really try again and again. Like they're just very careful the first time around, okay? Um, but there's definitely a physical skill being developed here. So this option is semi-correct, but we're not going to make any definitive choices until we go through all four options. So option B, a sense of letdown after a major achievement, we definitely don't see that. Um, there is no letdown here anywhere. If there was a letdown, there'll be negative connotations somewhere here, okay? Especially somewhere here. But you can see that it ends very positively. It ends very optimistically because they're waiting until the right waves gather. So they're, um, they're eager to experience this again. So not B, C, the achievement's possible when people work together. They don't really work together they're kind of just next to each other and doing this together, but we don't really see much working together per se. Um, and then D, the mastery of humans over the power of nature. We definitely see the power of nature very clearly in these first few stanzas, which is why it's really important when you actively read to summarize each stanza properly, right? We can see in this stanza, nature is quite formidable, right? We can see through this stanza, the surfers are introduced to us, right? We can see in this stanza, the surfers are being very careful with, with each movement that they're making, right? With this stanza, we can see the surfers are slowly being, um, slowly interacting with nature and even melding with nature as one because half wave, half men, right? We have that parallelism between the wave and the men. So, mastery, that's another keyword that we need to be very discerning about. We need to see if there's actually mastery in this poem. So this bit here really emphasizes that mastery because they say in time procession, they slice the face. Balance is triumph in this place, triumph possession. So we can see the repetition of triumph emphasizes how they've um, succeeded against this big, formidable nature, right? Um, and then the fact that they want to um, do this again. So between A and D, now that's the sort of um, difficult decision to make, which one is better? Now, A, if we really wanted to be critical of this, there's not much effort involved at the moment. Um, and also, is it a purely physical skill? Okay, um, you can argue that it's not purely physical. It could be a, a skill of perseverance as well, something like that. So in my opinion, D is the most appropriate answer. Okay, so I think the main thing is just figuring out what the best choice is. Alrighty, so that's the reading component. So let's go on to the diary writing entry. I'm sure you guys would have seen this question if you're very keen on knowing what last year's paper was. 
Um, the main thing I wanted to introduce to you was our sample response and I wanted to go through what we want students to look out for when crafting their own diary entry or any sort of response that they write for the writing exam. So I'll give you guys one, se uh, one minute to have a read through this. When you're reading through any question, think about what the keywords are. And you have to answer the question completely. That's another thing. So you can't just answer one part of the question. You have to look at the question holistically and answer every single part of it. You will lose marks if you don't answer every single part. So we have a look at this. This is quite a loaded question, okay? So we have this date already. We also have this part of the question here. So keywords are diary entry, so you already know your form. Someone your own age, so someone who's around 11, 10 even, 11 or 12. Living in the future, and then you need to start with this. And when you, and when you start something with the stimulus question, you have to make sure that these um, ideas in the stimulus are the central components in your piece as well. It's not good to just have the sentence and then write something else entirely because that shows the marker you're not really engaging with the question. And also, you need to think about this part as well. You can't just, so can you see how you can't just look at one part of the question? You have to look at the entire thing. All right. Um, now, with diary writing, just some key components would be a strong, sustained first person narrative voice being self-reflective, being confessional. So what that means is you're not just writing a recount, okay? A lot of um, people who don't do that well, they'll just assume that diary writing or journal writing um, is just, or even letter writing is just writing a recount of a series of events. But that's not good. What you need to do is show off how well you can write. And how do you do that? You need to characterize your character with a lot of depth. Your marker should know by the end of this piece what the character is like, what are their motivations, what are their likes and dislikes, why are they in this situation in the first place, right? Um, also, it's really important to think about the character's reactions to certain events in this uh, diary entry. It's not just about the character navigating through these series of events, but also their human response to um, these events. So talking about their emotions, showing their emotions, not telling the audience their emotions, but showing it. And how do you show? Well, as Sambo has previously said, you show through actions, you show through interactions with others, dialogue, how they dress, their appearance, um, and also their attitudes towards certain things, their perspectives towards certain things. That can really show a lot about a character. Also, with any sort of piece you write, you have to Think about the literary devices you want to use. Emotive language, metaphor, imagery, anaphora, all of these language devices, okay? So, um, just to brainstorm, and this is quite simplistic, but you guys can have a quick read through this and then we can go through it. So, First of all, you need to think about setting. So any sort of um, text type that you write in your writing section, you have to have a solid setting and a solid character. You need to introduce the setting and the character within the first few paragraphs. It's really important. You can't neglect one or the other. When you write, you need to think about it as though you're writing some film, okay? When you're, when you're watching a movie, right? Would we ever have a character without a setting? Definitely not, right? And also with the idea of showing not telling. It's very rare in a film for um, the director to be telling the audience everything about a character. They will never tell. They will show through lighting, through music, through costuming, facial expression, dialogue, right? The only time they might actually tell something would be through a voiceover, but that's not very common. So. A very, very good tip is just to write um, any sort of piece as though it's like a movie, okay? And that cuts out a lot of the story, uh, it cuts out a lot of the show and uh, telling. So it forces you to show things. 
it forces you to have a very clear setting in mind, to have a very clear idea of what the character is doing within the setting. All right. So in this case, consider the futuristic world of 2099. Um, what are the technological advancements, challenges to humanity? So what you guys need to show to the marker as well is that you're very mature, okay? That's something very important. And how do you develop this maturity? What I'll suggest to you guys is read the newspaper often, okay? Read it once a week. You can discuss uh, current social issues with your parents as well. For example, you know, social issues currently, we have racism, we have um, a fear of artificial intelligence taking over our jobs, we have environmental concerns. So it's really important to keep up to date with these things because that way you can show the marker that you're mature and you're great at critical thinking, okay? And also, not many other year sixes or year fives would have that mature worldview. So that way, your writing piece will be very different from everyone else's. Everyone else might just talk about, you know, fairy tale things, werewolves, um, I don't know. Anyway, you don't want to be immature like the majority of test takers. You want to have a very mature worldview, okay? So challenges to humanity, you need to think about what are the current challenges to humanity, right? Is it through, is it AI, is it... Um, deforestation, capitalism, what is it? Okay, stimulus. So what is the role of the seeing robot? And also with the stimulus, it's good to think about the stimulus metaphorically. It's good to think about it symbolically. So what might this symbolize even, right? Um, you should always have the stimulus as a motif as well. A motif is something that is almost like a symbol, but it's a recurring theme in the um, writing piece because you want something that's quite cohesive in your writing as well. You don't want to talk about five different things. You want to focus on one thing and do it well. Number three is your character. So what are their motivations, their flaws, their backstory? And once again, think about how, why this character is in this setting. What are they going to do in this setting? Number four, this is very important. Have a good idea of what your central anecdote is. So as I said previously, you don't want to have your journal or your diary entry as a series of events. You don't want it to sound like a recount that you write in uh, K to year four, right? You want to make sure that you focus on one central uh, narrative arc. You can technically almost write a diary entry very similar to a narrative, but of course you need to make sure it's consistent with the form of this diary entry. So you still need to make it confessional, make it first person, make it very personal, right? But just like a narrative, you need to have a beginning, complication, catalyst, and also a resolution. You need to make sure this character develops somehow. What I mean by character development is think about how they grow in the story, right? Not just, um, not in a very concrete way, but make sure that they grow mentally, that their perspectives shift that they learn something about themselves, that they understand that they need to improve, right? Okay, uh, and these are just some examples. So be creative, but also it's very nice to allude to social issues that are happening in our world. All right, so here's a structure. Um, no set structure for diary writing, but you just need to make sure you have a central event, have a chronological order of events, and in the first few paragraphs, Make sure you have setting characterization and start introducing the main conflict. That's really important because your writing piece will be very short. You don't have that much time to fluff around. So make sure you get to the point. And in order to have character development in a story, you really must have some sort of conflict that this character goes through to catalyze that shift in perspective. This is a checklist for success. So first of all, sustained and distinct first person narration voice. Uh, make sure that this narrative voice is cohesive, it's consistent, okay? That's what sustained means. Also distinct. We need to think about what makes this uh, narrative voice unique. So what I suggest, if you were to read novels or short stories to improve your writing is Read short stories, first of all, because you're writing a short story or you're writing a short piece of uh, fiction, right? Um, 
because the pacing's a bit different from a novel. Novels are way too long-winded, and you're not going to be writing a novel. So first of all, read short stories and try to read some modern short stories because modern short stories are a lot more experimental. So that way you can develop a distinct first-person narrative voice. In my opinion, there's not, not much point in reading Shakespeare or Jane Austen or Charles Dickens when all you're writing about is, um, what you're writing is a modern writing piece. Sure, you can read Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Jane Austen when you're in high school, when you're writing an essay on it. But if your purpose is to improve your um, writing for your selective exam or your scholarship exam, it's better to read modern great works of literature. So um, what you guys can do tonight is Google postmodern novels. You can Google that or postmodern short stories and you'll see on Google there's a whole bunch of it and I'll, I'll highly recommend reading those rather than the, you know, the older text because you can't, you're not writing in that sort of style anyway. Okay, uh, second of all, show not tell the speaker's emotions. We've already covered that. Um, each paragraph should have something different. Remember, you can't repeat things in your writing piece. You have to make sure that we are building a narrative arc. Um, and in this case, because the stimulus is about futurism, you need a futuristic setting and a strong use of the stimulus. So here we have an exemplar um, written by one of our tutors. So you can have a read through this and then I'll go through what makes it good. Okay, so I'm assuming you finished reading this first slide. Go to the second slide now. Okay, and moving on to the last bit. All right, that should be enough time. So, uh, the first thing you notice is that this answers the stimulus very well. First of all, the robot is in the central uh, is the central component of this piece. Second of all, it answers the rest of the question very well. So it it has a futuristic setting, right? It's talking about technological advances as well. Third thing um, you notice about this piece is. We have the central character, we have a conflict as well, we have a series of events that leads to a conclusion, right? We have two main characters in this case. We have the persona, so the person who's writing this diary, and we also have their arch enemy, essentially, Marisol, right? And we can see the conflict between them, which leads to a resolution and also this persona growing. So there we have the character development. Let's go through this paragraph by paragraph. And when we're doing this as well, I'll point out some literary devices 
and the effect uh, that is uh, constructed through these literary devices. So, dear diary, when our house robot woke me up with its loud singing, I remember that day, uh, today might be the last time I ever see, ever hear my sweet robot pet, Melody. The clock had struck 13. Okay, so one thing that you guys need to think about is how you can use words to craft a certain sense of mood or atmosphere. Okay, so clock usually has, um, you know, the, the maximum is 12 o'clock, but in this case, the clock was striking 13. And that indicates a sense of jarringness, right? Something is quite ominous. It foreshadows something that might happen. So can you see how just this truncated sentence, so truncated just means a shortened sentence, how this uh, shortened sentence with this interesting um, event that happened in this short sentence constructs a mood, right? It constructs this ominous mood. I was sitting in Space Voyager 2000 cleaning my aquamarine tail. So you can already see the character being introduced. You also see the setting, okay? The setting is in a spaceship and the character has this tail. Um, and the spaceship lurched back and forth through the northern asteroid belt. One other thing when you guys are doing your create, uh, doing your writing piece is making sure you have detail. So once again, think about your uh, writing piece as though it's a movie, right? Is your movie going to be in black and white? Is it going to lack detail about the setting? No, it's not. So can you see how here, the northern asteroid belt, we have a very clear sense of setting, right? One way to make your setting a bit clearer is to have specific names for specific things. It just makes it a lot more authentic and it allows the audience to have a clear picture in their minds. Okay, so the row of Miss Galaxy contestants before me fixated on their holograms as silence settled in like a brick wall between us. So we have a simile here which further conveys this mood of um, foreboding, ominous, a brick wall. The connotations of brick wall uh, suggest there's this sense of uh, separation between her and everyone else, this emotional separation as well, right? Okay, and we're already introduced to what... Uh, may be going on here, so potentially there's some sort of beauty pageant, right? And you can see all of that detail is introduced to us in the very first paragraph. So that's what your first paragraph should be. It should introduce to us the setting, the character, and what the character is doing in the setting, right? It should also have language devices. Just two to three language devices is all we need just to give a positive first impression to our marker. Remember, this marker probably has marked hundreds of papers on the same day. So how are you going to stand out from all the other hundreds of papers? You're going to impress the marker from the very first paragraph with a very unique and very sophisticated language devices. Okay? Um, I held my beloved robo pet close to me, even through the fireproof portholes of the spaceship. So once again, very detailed sense of setting. We know that there are fireproof portholes. So remember, it's all in the detail. You need to have detail in your setting so that the marker is able to visualize this very well. An example of a, a B, B grade student. They would just say, even through the walls of the spaceship. That's all they would say, or even through the rooms of the spaceship. Can you see how that's less detailed? Okay. I could feel the relentless heat of the red planet beating down on me. So, when you're doing your setting as well, it's really important to have more than one sense. When we're doing description, a lot of us tend to just stick with the visual side of things. Because we as humans, we're very visual, right? But... Remember, we have five senses. So one way of making our setting very vivid to the marker is to have more than one sense. In this case, relentless heat, okay? So that's the sense of touch, right? So we've got some visual imagery in the previous paragraph. So now we've got a sense of touch. So can you see how that makes things a lot more vivid, right? 
the woman in front, Marek Sol, was the native contestant. So here in the second paragraph, we're only introducing something that might be related to the conflict. Yes? Okay. Her scales were red like the sun. One other thing is, remember, showing not telling. One of the ways of showing not telling is showing through the appearance of someone. So just like in a movie where a bad character might be dressed in black, you can see here, her scales are red like the sun. Can you see how that's opposing um, the main character's aquamarine tail? Aquamarine has connotations of calmness, serenity, whereas red like the sun, it has fiery connotations. So once again, we're thinking about the connotations of things, right? Every word has an associated meaning. So when you're writing something, you have to be very mindful about these connotations, these word choices you're making. Her eyes maroon like blood. Once again, negative connotation here, blood. Blood connotes violence, um, death even, danger, right? I shifted in my seat. One other thing you guys need to be mindful of when you're doing your writing piece is thinking about the length of sentences. We have longer sentences, but we also have shorter sentences. So shorter sentences, another way of saying that is truncated sentence. And what that usually suggests is a sense of tension, right? A sense of danger, a sense of fragmentation as well. So in this case, to emphasize her discomfort with this, here is a short sentence to emphasize that tension. Okay, moving on. Glory is it to be young in this galaxy. My mother had whispered excitedly to me before my departure. One other thing as well is making sure that you have a flashback in any sort of writing piece you do. Okay, Flashbacks add depth to the character. And just have one main flashback. Don't have multiple flashbacks, otherwise it gets very confusing for the marker because you're constantly jumping back and forth between timelines, but just one is enough. So, um, she had clean RoboPed's LED lights. So once again, it's all in the detail, LED lights rather than just lights. So that I could gift it to the Red Planet natives during the Miss Galaxy offerings ceremony. So now we know that they're getting close to this uh, first ceremony um, as part of the Miss Galaxy competition. So can you see how each paragraph is building on from the one before, and we're never repeating anything. That's one thing. Don't repeat anything you say, even if you're using different words, okay? We want to make sure our story progresses. Senya, she said, you must bring back uh, pride to the people of our beautiful ice planet. How I miss my mother. Okay, so just like varying sentence lengths, you can also vary paragraph lengths to convey certain ideas. This is also very emotive. So remember, for uh, letter writing or diary writing or journal writing, we have to have emotions, right? It's really important because this is meant to be reflect, uh, reflective. The clock had struck 14, okay. Um, so having a motif is quite nice as well. A motif is something that's recurring in the story and it usually has some sort of meaning with it. I could feel Marisol's glare burning into me. I too had heard stories about her. So can you see how we're starting to develop this conflict? Just like me, she was the face of her planet. Just like me, her home had been vandalized by the troopers. Okay, so this is a technique called anaphora. So A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A. Essentially, it's the repetition of a phrase in successive um, phrases or sentences. And this emphasizes something. In this case, it emphasizes there's a commonality between the persona and Marisol. Okay, so once again, use your techniques. Use your techniques to convey any sort of meaning you want to convey, right? So here it's emphasizing that commonality. And we'll see why that's important later down, down the track. She will stop at nothing for the Miss Galaxy title. So once again, introducing that conflict. This paragraph is also introducing the conflict. Um, just a few minutes after I walked away, I heard my darling Robo pet fall to the ground. Sister malfunction, sister mal. So you can see how we're going back to the stimulus. It's really important to go back to the question. I ran back to an unspeakable scene. So this is the major conflict here. Marisol held Robo pet's neck in a headlock as she tried to break its headlights. So all of this is 
conflict and you can read through this yourself. Um, also, it's good to have a bit of dialogue, but not too much. In this case, this is the perfect amount. Her grass was too strong, her eyes were too red. Okay, so you can see the repetition of two to emphasize that tension and the aggression as well. Okay, moving on. So this all is the conflict. And then we can see what happens after the conflict, which leads to the resolution. So this bit here, we have her reflecting, um, you know, what she experienced when she had this robot. And this leads to her character development as well. And here we've got a very effective rhetorical question. It's in its own little paragraph to emphasize the importance of it. Here's also a turning point in the story. A turning point is very important in any sort of writing piece you do because that indicates a development in character. Okay, um, for the first time on this voyage, so this indicates to us there is this change now. I wondered if beneath those crimson eyes, beneath those angry fumes, once again we've got that repetition, okay? So repetition is very effective if you do it well. Breathe in, breathe out. So here we have um, an interesting variation in the structure of this sentence. And it's, it's great to experiment with your um, structure as well. That's why um, I previously recommended for you guys to have a look at postmodern literature, postmodern novels, postmodern short stories. And that way you can have some creativity and have a, a guidance on how you can make your writing piece stand out from everyone else's. Marek Sol looked confused at first, startled by the sudden stillness. So you can see how here we're slowly getting to some sort of resolution. I seem to have captured her attention. I continue to breathe, okay? So now we're getting to that resolution here as well. Uh, one thing uh, that's very effective in any sort of writing piece is the use of contrast as well, the use of opposites. Opposites can be used to make something more jarring, or it can be used to make something a bit more um, intriguing, okay? In this case, we were strangers chained inextricably to the rhythm of our heart and breath. So you can see here, even though they're strangers, they're chained together now, right? Can you see how those are opposites, yeah? And that emphasizes this resolution. Okay, that brings me to this very moment. I do not know if I can forgive Marixol or if I can never forget, but that is not what I care about right now. And then you've got this uh, letter here addressed to uh, her dear robo pet, and you've got a very poignant concluding sentence. So it's really important not only to start your um, writing piece with something very intriguing, but also to end it off with something very poignant. Alrighty, so that concludes our seminar for today. Thank you so much for your attention. Now, if you have any questions, I'll give you one minute to send us a text of any questions you may have. If we don't have any questions, then we'll wrap it up. Now, we've got our WeChat QR code if anyone's interested here as well. We've got our phone number uh, if you want to request any seminar uh, PDFs. Um, yeah, so we'll see if we have any questions. All right, I guess not. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was great giving you all this knowledge and hopefully you would take away something quite valuable from today's seminar. Any questions, you have our number, so just contact us at any time. Thank you.